Welcome, everyone, to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Well, last year, Tracy, it was a difficult, if not a brutal, influenza season. More than 900,000 people were hospitalized, and more than 80,000 Americans died of the flu during the winter of 2017-18. That, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Now, it's true, most of those deaths were in people over the age of 65, but the flu also killed 180 young children and teenagers, more than any other year since the CDC began using its current surveillance methods. Recently, the Food and Drug Administration approved a new flu treatment, the first new treatment in 20 years, but the FDA has made it clear it is not a replacement for the flu vaccine. Exactly. Here to discuss all things flu is the head of Mayo <laughs> Clinic's vaccine research group, Dr. Gregory Poland. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Poland. Thank you. For all things flu. There we go. <laughs> Good to have you here, Dr. Poland. Thank you. you know, I've heard your voice when it sounded a little bit better. You don't have the flu, do you? I don't have the flu, but I do have a laryngitis uh, that I'm recovering from, from a, a upper respiratory viral infection. How can you tell the difference between that and the flu? That's a great question. My wife asked me that. When you have influenza, the classic symptoms are fever, muscle aches, really sore throat. I don't have those. I have, you know, runny nose, uh, that kind of thing. More like a cold. More like a Mm -hmm. viral upper respiratory infection. It resolves on its own and that you don't need antibiotics for. (laughs) Good point. (laughs) So any predictions about this year's flu season? No way to know. Um, What I can say is that the components of the flu vaccine based on last year were changed and are consistent with the viruses that are circulating worldwide. The problem with this virus is it can mutate like that and change, and that happened last year. Um, and people, you know, began to think, well, is it worth getting the flu vaccine? Am I getting any protection? The answer is yes. Even though you might develop symptoms, you didn't develop pneumonia, you didn't get hospitalized, and you didn't die. I do recall last year hearing that it was a large number of young people, of children, yes. who passed away because yeah. of the flu. So that part of what Dr. Shives was saying in our intro didn't surprise me. But 80,000 Americans, yes. I don't know that I heard that number wow. last year. That's a lot of people. It really is. And, and, and let me just mention that you know those are modeling numbers. In other words, we can't actually go to every home and count who died. This is the important point because people think, well, it's just the flu. Mm-hmm. And they don't realize that what, how influenza kills people is not usually by the primary infection. It's the complications. Mm -hmm. It's the diabetic whose diabetes goes out of control. It's the person with heart disease who has a a heart attack or a stroke as a result. So when you actually look at what brought people into the hospital and then backtrack, you find out, oh, they had influenza Mm -hmm. or influenza symptoms the week or two before this. So we give this vaccine primarily to prevent the complications. And that's such a hard thing to get across to people. It's not, well, I'm taking this so that I won't have a sore throat. You're taking this vaccine and we're recommending it so you don't have the severity or the complications that this virus can cause. It's not a benign virus. So let's talk about the vaccine. I know uh, I looked on the CDC site and it said you really ought to get it by the end of October. I did. I don't think Tracy's gotten hers yet. Right uh, under the bus. <laughs> what? Look at him. I brought one with me, Tom. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> um so who should get the flu vaccine? And let's talk also about the, the dose and what you recommend for seniors. Yeah. Well, you have asked the right person <laughs> because uh, while it took me seven years, in 2010, the CDC finally accepted my recommendation, unanimously voted that all Americans six months and older, all Americans should annually receive a flu vaccine. That was your idea? That was mine. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. So Mayo Clinic <laughs> If it deserves, would only come true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, so, so that's really important, and that particularly covers the younger children. Now, when you get to older adults, and I'm in that age group now, we have the highest rates of complication from influenza. So what do you do? Because that's also the age group that doesn't respond well to the vaccine. Well, there are now three vaccines. So, you know, this this issue in American medicine and that Mayo Clinic has really 
been a leader in this idea of personalized or individualized medicine, this is coming true in the vaccine field. We have eight, nine different vaccines. We can give the right vaccine to the right person the right dose. When it gets to older people, three vaccines now that are particularly effective in older people. So when you're 65 and older, you ask your healthcare provider for one of the vaccines that's meant specifically for older adults. Now, last year you just had two, as I recall. You Correct. had the, the high dose and they had the adjuvanted, which would kind of jack well, up there, your immune there, system. Yeah, and, the, and mm-hmm. there's the recombinant one. The adjuvanted one is the one that got added last year. Okay, yeah. so the three are the high dose, the adjuvanted, recombinant, and the, and the and the recombinant. So recombinant. those three. Okay, so if you're a senior, yeah. and senior means sixty-five and older, yes, you need to ask to make sure that you get one of those three. Correct, and uh, a lot of times, you know, people get their flu vaccine at uh, alternative sites. Some, like a pharmacy, for example, smaller pharmacies might not carry that, so you need to ask. What about the nasal vaccine? The nasal vaccine is now recommended again this year. What happened is that the process that they used when they moved to adding the fourth strain decreased the efficacy of the vaccine, so it was not recommended last year. They've changed that, and it's now available again. So let's say that I'm not 65, but uh, I've had a history of having had the flu previously, and I know I don't want to get it again. Could I get the high dose? Could I say, you know, I'm 60, I'd, li- I'd like the high dose? Yeah. Because, I mean, it's got four times as much an- antigen, right? Yeah. Four well, times and, as you know, powerful? The, the, the three vaccines we talked about for older people are about 30-plus percent more effective than the standard vaccine in that age group. So your question really is one of can a physician give a vaccine what's called Mm off-label. In other words, it's not approved by the FDA for somebody who's age 60, but could a physician do that? And the answer is yes. You'd want to record why you did that. There would need to be, you know, a defensible reason for it. You could, depending on your insurance coverage, run into difficulties with them covering the cost of that vaccine. But yes, it can be done. I think you're only 30, but you ought to get the high dose. She's 30. I will. She looks like she's in her 20s. <laughs> I will. I will leave here and go and take care of that business. Um, you said it at the beginning, but I think it bears repeating because even your wife was a little concerned about what is or what yeah. is not the flu. Yeah. Let's do a list. What is the flu and what is not the okay. flu? So let's take a uh, just a respiratory virus, Okay. Now, there can be overlap between this, but we'll just take the classic case. Itchy eyes, runny nose, maybe a little bit of a cough. That's it. Influenza, classic. Very fast onset of severe muscle and joint aches, sore throat, fever. It's not a day or two. It's longer than that. You don't typically have a runny nose. You don't have nausea and vomiting. And when you have that, depending on the complications or depending on your age group or other medical problems that you have, there's a new drug available to treat. A single dose decreases symptoms within 24 hours and decreases the length of symptoms by a day to a day and a half. But here's the proviso. You got to get the drug within 48 hours of symptoms. And there is a test for the flu, right? You can do a throat swab and they can tell you what in an hour or four hours? Within an hour or two, it's called point of care testing. So you go into a a, a, a continuity clinic, an emergency room, anything like that, urgent care, and they can tell you, do you have influenza or not? And you got to take that drug. How many drugs are available now? You got Tamiflu and then the new one. Six drugs. And uh, Relenza. Rapibavab or that, that na- one's, name them. That one's only used IV in the hospital. Okay. So the ones that tend to be used are Tamiflu and now this new drug. And the reason for it is that these influenza viruses can quickly develop resistance against these antiviral drugs. The advantage of this new drug is it even treats those drug-resistant viruses. It treats avian viruses. So this is the first new flu drug in 20 years, has a unique mechanism of action, so we're very excited about it. Zofluza? Zofluza. Zofluza. 
So if yeah, you get it's a it, odd then, name. If you forget to get that shot again today, then you can get a little zofluza if you, uh, if you get the flu. And how do I protect myself from getting the flu finally? Well, there's a variety of things. The most important is you get a vaccine. Right. And the other thing <laughs> is you stay away from sick people <laughs> and you keep your hands out of your eyes, nose, and mouth and you wash your hands frequently. And let me just say one other thing because this is so much in the news. Influenza and influenza vaccines are not a political issue. They are a health issue. It is a medical issue. And we recommend as physicians that everybody get this vaccine because of the problems and the complications we see. These are safe vaccines. Another change this year is any vaccine licensed in the U.S., if you have egg allergies, no matter how severe those allergies, you can get any influenza vaccine. Oh. We still ask about egg allergies to be cautious and to be sure we watch you, but there is no detectable egg protein in today's vaccine. All right, there you go. Everything you wanted to know about the flu and flu vaccines. We're talking with Mayo, a Mayo Clinic expert, Dr. Greg Poland. Time for a short break, but when we come back, we'll cover some other vaccine topics, including the HPV vaccine, which is now approved for some adults over the age of 25. And we'll get an update on the new vaccine for herpes zoster called Shingrix. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We've been talking about the flu vaccine and the flu season with the head of Mayo Clinic's vaccine research group, Dr. Greg Poland. So, Dr. Poland, let's talk now about the HPV vaccine. Mm. Um, and we also know that there's a lot of people walking around who are carrying this virus. Tell us about that. And yeah, why. you know, I think one thing to note is that you can't tell who has it. Now, if they have genital warts, you can tell, but most people you can't tell. Almost everybody who's sexually active in the U.S. will get infected with this virus. It is out of control. And that's why this vaccine was developed. Traditionally, we've only given it up to the age of 26. This new studies have been done. We have a nine valent. There are over 100 different types of this virus. So there are nine of them in this vaccine. They are the ones that cause cancer and genital warts, which, by the way, the genital warts, there is no cure for. Once okay. you got them, you got them. Yeah, and, and this virus causes about seven different cancers. So I, as the way I tell people, HPV is sexually transmitted cancer, and we can prevent that. But why did they raise the age? Because I thought that you could only get it to age 26, or it was very important to get it when you're young, because if you had become sexually active, you probably already had it, and it was too late. Yeah, so fortunately, most many people who get infected with it will resolve it, but many will not. You can't tell who will and who won't, so we immunize everybody. Um, and what has happened is with the new vaccine, the, the Gardasil 9 is what it's called, they found that you can indeed induce protective levels of antibody all the way up to 45 in men and women. Now, you're right that, uh, so the question comes up, what happens if somebody we know had an infection? Well, they probably only got infected with one of the types or maybe two. Remember that this vaccine has nine, so we're still trying to protect them against the other types. What, what types of problems... You've already said the cancer, but what yeah. happens if you have HPV? Well, typically what happens is um, one of two things. The later onset or development of a cancer. So almost all the head and neck cancers in the U.S. are due to HPV. It causes penile, uh, anal, cervical, vaginal cancers. These, these are bad actors and sometimes hard to pick up. And the treatment for them is not very easy. Um, so that's one issue. The second issue is genital warts. Uh, believe it or not, we have clinics now around the U.S. where in particular young women are coming in and their airway is lined mm. with genital warts. The only thing we can do is laser one by one. It's extraordinarily painful. And they will face this the rest of their life. Because they keep coming back. Because they keep coming back. There's no cure. Oh, say it isn't so. You have a clinic for that. Yes. Young women. Yes. Now, is it also true that uh, there are more cases of uh, oral cancer, cancer of the mouth, tonsil, 
et cetera, caused by HPV than cervical cancer cases? Absolutely. Wow, yeah. isn't that, it's incredible. Yeah. It's hard to believe. And, and people, people are not aware of this. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what the typical response just to deal with it is that parents will say, well, my child's not sexually active and, you know, they're not going to get this disease. Oh, yes, they will. Yeah. Oh, oh yes, they so will. Now up to age 45. Yes. Two doses, though, still? Three it do- used to be three? or it, It's two doses up to the age of 15. After that, three doses. All right. And a month apart, as I recall? Yeah, that- they basically go zero, one, and six. Okay. So you could get that, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're over there getting your flu shot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, so, Dr. Shai. Uh, before, <laughs> before we talk about Shingrix, um, I want to ask you, uh, there are a lot of, of children now, it seems, and that their parents aren't having them vaccinated against anything. I assume this is a huge concern for you. Did you say not getting? Not any? getting. Yeah, this not is. Not getting vaccines. This is, this is my nightmare, Tom. I mean, these are diseases that you and I, through medical school and training in our practice, we have watched people die or their lives be irreversibly changed by these infections. Um, and, and yet, I, I mean, literally, literally, I've torn my hair out over this. The, we live in a culture where people tend to give more credence to celebrities than scientists. Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll, Mayo Clinic will give them advice and they may not give it the, the due that it, it should, they should, and they'll listen to some you know, celebrity say something on a TV who has zero scientific training. Yeah, it's pretty sad. I mean, the way, the way I've said it to my colleagues is, uh, guess what? Ignorance does kill. Yeah. Well, everybody needs to listen to this podcast, for sure. <laughs> for I mean, sure. it's so much good information, and yeah. what you've just talked about is so important. Listen to celebrities instead of science. And I you mean, know, the, the way, love it. The way, what a great line. The way it works is... Um, you said that wrong. <laughs> Say it, correct what you just said. You said listen to celebrities instead of science. That's what he said. A oh. lot of people do. Oh, okay, That's what gotcha. I meant to say. Gotcha. And all of this is a balance of risk versus benefit. Now, And uh, let me be completely honest. No vaccine's 100% effective. No vaccine's 100% safe. In fact, nothing in our experience of anything we do in our lives is 100% safe. So wisdom resides in looking at the data and getting the most benefit for the least risk. Every time that's been done around the world over decades, vaccines come far, far ahead of any risk. We have 30 seconds left to talk about Shingrix. Yeah, wow. So is it available? First of all, it's been in short supply. Second of all, I had that. You're not old enough to get it, and it makes your arm pretty (laughs) sore. That's because there's an adjuvant in there, and that's what makes it so powerful. This vaccine is about 97% effective, even in older adults, whereas the other vaccine that we had, that protection tended to wear off after about five years. So it is a two-dose vaccine, the demand has been beyond what the manufacturer thought, and so they probably won't catch up until the first quarter of 2019. What if I've already had shingles? Do I still need to get vaccinated? Absolutely. Okay. You definitely get recurrent shingles. All right. All right. Everybody over the age of 50, Shingrix, another one you got to get, but yeah. you're not there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't well, thanks, add a third one to your regimen today. <laughs> I think I might be. <laughs> We've been talking about uh, vaccines with the head of Mayo Clinic's Vaccine Research Group, Dr. Greg Poland. Dr. Poland, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure.